Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I Please don't start. know that this is for me, maybe more for the camera, but good morning. Thank you for coming to the Black Cultural Center for our uh, conference. Uh, we are excited to have you all here, and I'm terribly excited to have this stellar panel talking to us about Afrofuturism, especially on the release of what was, I'm sure, a marvelous movie last night. Please, if you saw it, don't give me spoilers, because I can't see it until Monday. Um, but I'm excited to have them here, and I hope that they uh, answer the questions that you all have come with, as I'm sure you've come with many. I have some of my own. But we're going to jump right into it. And just a bit of logistics. We have a panelist from Iowa who is, who is on the webcast here. She can hear you. If you have questions for her, we'll be able to relay those to her as well. So I'm going to jump right in and introduce our moderator and then hand it over to her. Uh, excited to have Dr. Marlo David here, who is the director of Purdue's African American Studies and Research Center. She's also an associate professor of English and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. Her research focuses on contemporary African American literature and culture and their intersections with political and social movements. Um, she is the author of Mama's Gun, Black Maternal Figures and the Politics of Transgression which examines how writers use representations of transgressive black motherhood to challenge neoliberalism. Uh, her scholarly essays have appeared in Tulsa Studies of Women's Literature, Black Camera, an International Film Journal, and the American Review. Her teaching speci uh, specialties include black gender and sexuality and sexual studies, Afrofuturism, and black feminist thought. Uh, she is currently working on a book about the writer and author and filmmaker Bill Gunn. So clearly, she is qualified to be leading uh, today's uh, conversation. So I'm going to hand it over to her. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Happy Black ba Panther Day. Yeah. All right. Let's make this a turn this into an annual uh, day of, of celebration, February 16th. Uh, I welcome you to uh, this event and would like to go ahead and get right in to introducing our um, panelists and having a conversation about Afrofuturism and the aesthetic movements, the representation, the cultural production that's related to this concept of Afrofuturism. I will start with our guest who is on our Skype. Uh, first, uh, 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 Miss Deborah Whaley, Dr. Deborah Whaley, can you hear me, Deborah? I can, oh. especially if, if everyone speaks directly into the microphone, I can hear really well. You're good to go. Okay, great. Okay. So, uh, Deborah Elizabeth Whaley is an artist, curator, writer, and professor of American Studies and African American Studies at the University of Iowa. She received degrees in American Studies from uh, UC Santa Cruz, Cal State uh, MA from Cal State Fullerton, and her PhD from the University of Kansas. Her research and teaching fields include the institutional history, theories, and methods of American and cultural studies, 19th and 20th century American cultural history, comparative ethnic studies, black cultural studies, the digital humanities, popular culture, and the visual arts. Her recent book is Black Women in Sequence, re comics, graphic novels, and anime. It explores graphic novel production and comic book fandom, looking in particular at African, African American, and multi-ethnic women as deployed in television, film, animation, gaming, and print representations of comic book and graphic novel characters. Okay, so that's our Skype guest, Professor Whaley. Uh, to my left, we have Leah Milne. Uh, professor Milne, uh, she is an assistant professor of multicultural American literature at the University of Indianapolis. Uh, while she teaches many courses, including postcolonial literature, selfie fiction, African American literature and composition, she probably is best known on campus for her interdisciplinary course on Beyonce's Lemonade. Oh, we have to talk. Uh, her research primarily focuses on issues related to ethnic identity and authorship in contemporary ethnic American literature. To Leah's left, we have Ashley A. Woods. Ashley A. Woods is an illustrator, writer, and creator from Chicago who got her start through self-publishing her action fantasy comic series, Millennia War, while attending the International Academy of Design and Technology. After earning her BFA in film and animation, she traveled to Kyoto, Japan, where she presented her work at Kyoto University. She began her professional work in comics with Niobe, She is Life, 
yes, with actress Amanla Stenberg and Sebastian A. Jones of Stranger Comics. In December 2017, the graphic novel for Niobe was released with a forward by actress Viola Davis. She then moved on to Lady Castle for Boom, as well as providing variant covers for Black Mask Studio. Ashley is currently working on a Tomb Raider Survivor's Crusade for Dark Horse Comics based on the popular video game. When Ashley isn't working, she enjoys traveling, playing video games, reading comics and manga, and watching movies. Wonderful. And to her left, we have Professor Jonathan Gales. Uh, Jonathan Gales is a professor of African American Studies at Georgia State University. He is a graduate of Morehouse College, uh, Winthrop University, and a PhD from the University of South Florida. Um, his primary in areas of interest include anthropology of education, black masculinity, and critical media studies. And in 2012, he produced an independent documentary on African-American comic book superheroes entitled White Scripts and Black Supermen, Black Masculinities in Comic Books. The American Culture Association, Popular Culture Association, awarded this documentary the 2013 Peter Rollins Best Documentary Film Award. It can be found at blacksuperman.com, supermen.com. Uh, he also recently finished his second documentary film entitled The E-Word, a documentary on the ebonics debate. This film examines the context of the national furor in response to the Oakland School District's resolution on ebonics. The film pursues a more informed understanding of the E-Word through the use of archival footage and interviews with former students, teachers, administrators, policymakers, and scholars that were directly involved with the resolution and the national debate that ensued. So with that, I'd like you all to welcome this esteemed panel for, with us today. All right, well, let's just get started and get into it. I really would like us to maybe start with uh, an opportunity for each of you to remark upon your uh, perspectives on what is Afrofuturism. We see, we're seeing this word kind of thrown around in the culture now uh, a lot more, and a lot of people maybe think they know what, they, what it means or it may have multiple meanings. Uh, maybe, Deborah, if we could start with you, could you tell us a little bit about what you think Afrofuturism describes? Absolutely, and I just quickly want to say um, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm very excited to join this uh, conversation. So for me, uh, it, what was really influential is Alondra Nelson's, um, you know, uh, anthology, um, or rather her uh, special issue of social text on Afrofuturism. And so in my scholarship and in my teaching, I really draw from her definition. And so um, one of the things that um, Alondra Nelson points out in her uh, introduction to this special issue of social text on Afrofuturism is the ways in which we might think of Afrofuturism as um, a, a, a sort of form to not only think about sort of Afrocentric or um, you know, African-centric types of narratives, but to think about uh, the ways in which African-American people or people of African can descent may be reimagined in present narratives, but also in future narratives as well. And so I think a part of the intervention that Afrofuturism tries to make is to again, um, bring in that sort of um, racial ethnic center core to speculative narratives, to science fiction, and in some ways sort of bordering um, horror narratives as well, um, but also to intervene in that a lot of times in uh, science fiction and in horror and uh, futurist types of narratives, whether it's film or television or in print, when uh, people of African descent are um, depicted, we're sort of depicted in a, a sort of dystopic way, um, or we die very soon. And so oftentimes there's not a sort of full imagining of where we fit uh, in the future. And or another thing um, that Alondra Nelson and others point out is that uh, some futurist narratives are very either like dystopic or utopic. So you may have uh, people of African descent depicted in a, a again, film, television, um, comics, any type of um, print narrative, but um, their blackness may not matter insofar as it's a sort of colorblind narrative. So there's this tension between and a lot of futuristic narratives that were either not present 
uh, or that we are there, but our difference doesn't seem to matter because we're never kind of connected to any legible cultural core. And so I think what Afrofuturism tries to do is to um, reimagine Blackness in the present, in the future, and in the past, and sort of think about the ways in which all those um, you know, time elements can, can meet to um, imagine Blackness anew aesthetically and uh, culturally to move out of sort of binaries of, of race sometimes and gender. And so um, one of the things I find really exciting about what Afrofuturism is able to do is um, that because a lot of the narratives do take place uh, in the future, it offers this space to imagine and rethink Blackness anew in productive ways that can connect to cultural politics. And I know later we're going to talk about you know, the ways in which um, people who are working in the Afrofuturist uh, realm are able to uh, address uh, social relations and politics and all these other things um, in the future as a way to sort of be prescriptive about the possibilities, progressive possibilities. Right. The progress. Okay. So the progressive possibilities of thinking about blackness in these various time periods, and we're gonna we're gonna unpack a lot of these definitions and descriptions as we go on. Leah, what what how, what does Afrofuturism describe for you? Um, so just to add on to to what Deborah was saying, I think that especially with Black Panther coming out, there's going to be um, a sense that this word kind of generically means black people in the future, and I want to just sort of push against that, that broad mm -hmm. definition. Um, even though I think that there's, there's a productive element in saying, well, this can apply to multiple fields um, and multiple areas, I want to I, I kind of emphasize the fact that this is not just a way of saying, hey, black people exist in the future, but also to, uh, it's, it's pushing against narratives that suggest that, uh, that it associates blackness with primitivism. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also, uh, pushing a social agenda as well. So there, there's a way in which saying that black people are not only um, in the future, but they're successful and that they have acquired a lot of the emotional and social tools necessary to survive in the future is, is a kind of post, a, a political and social statement. Wow, so we can also think about this from that sort of political and social perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ashley, what about you? What is Afrofuturism? So, um, so to me, Afro, can you guys hear me okay? No? Is her the mic not on? Okay, it doesn't, it's not a projection. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, to me, okay. Yeah. Well, to me, Afrofuturism is basically futurism, the concept of futurism told with, through the, aesthetic, the aesthetic and the frame of being black or black culture. Um, it's, it started out basically, first it was coined in 94, and that uh, term was coined, but it was brought about basically um, pointing to the lack of black artists and writers uh, in the media. But even before that, we had elements of it in the media, like with music, like Parliament. Now, mm -hmm. uh, there's another music artist named Sun Ra. I'm not familiar with his work, mm -hmm. so I have to go to YouTube and check it out. Yeah. But I am familiar with Parliament and the Funkadelics. And you know, you, you mentioned the, uh, how it affects the social and political aspects of it. A lot of times when we see black characters in culture, as, we're, as what was mentioned uh, before, we usually die first or something tragic happens to us or our character is centered around a non-black character or a white character. Uh, we don't really have a nuanced um, you know, background. So with that being said, also with Parliament, they, sh they showed or they reflected the social uh, injustices we were facing and you know, let's look at the mothership connection. You know, they, they show um, hey, we don't have to lose out in the end. You know, things that don't have to be so tragic as they may feel tragic or hard uh, in our waking life, you know? And so um, it's a way to use your imagination to, to um, foresee a, a, a better possible future or a way to express, you know, a better future. So that's basically how I see it. Yeah, yeah that imaginative uh, space of possibility is, is very key. Jonathan, how would, you, how would you talk about it? I, I don't think I can improve upon these very expansive definitions yeah. of Afrofuturism, except to, to say that, you know, we, 
I think almost everyone has mentioned or used the word imagining, mm -hmm. imagination. And so for me, Afrofuturism is about um, the legitimacy of black imagination and really uh, asserting the right of, of black people to imagine instead of being grounded in these very limiting and very rigid frames of reference that we see in popular culture that are most often bound to black suffering or laughter, uh, often at the expense of black people. This is about our right to imagine ourselves as we will. And so to me, that's a very key uh, component of what uh, Afrofuturism uh, is. So with those, uh, we've got several sort of uh, intersecting ideas, I think, when I think about Afrofuturism. I'm hearing, uh, obviously, the futurism, right? We're, we are thinking in some ways about what the future looks like, but it's not always necessarily um, specifically technological. It has things to do with sort of the social um, progress narrative of how uh, black people and blackness, black culture, persists or exists uh, as we move forward, but it also um, moves uh, backward in time in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. So it's also reflective, it's, it's uh, looking at sort of aesthetics and, um, and, and historical uh, experiences that then are mapped into that, those sort of futuristic. So it's working on sort of all of those temporal um, spaces, which I think is sort of the the richness of it, and and I and I love to hear all of you sort of speak about where, uh, you know, even though the the term is fairly new, the product, the the process, the the actual cultural production is not new, right? So so that uh, we can look throughout spaces and and black culture um, that that have been Afrofuturistic for a real long time. So maybe uh, you all can uh, maybe respond to a question that sort of thinks about sort of. Where, where do we see Afrofuturism? What, what would be examples of it? Um, and how does it intersect with um, uh, Afrocentrism uh, mm -hmm. and the, the, the aesthetic or the movement that we call Afrocentrism? I don't know who wants to maybe jump in. I'm gonna let this be round robin. Anyone have a, a particular? I'm, yeah, Deborah, you wanna go ahead? Yeah, sure, I would yeah. be happy to start. So I'm so yeah. glad that Ashley brought up music. And yeah. uh, you know, so when I think of Afrofuturism, uh, I also think of a moment wherein maybe we weren't calling it Afrofuturism, but the aesthetic and the um, cultural intention um, behind what some artists were doing, you could very legibly see it as Afrocentric today. So yes, like Parliament Funkadelic, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire, right? Uh, so these are bands who, um, dressed in a sort of very otherworldly way uh, to press how we see black masculinity and how we see blackness. There was a lot of play with um, the way in which they would present themselves and so far as dress was concerned. And then their music as well, right? So um, lyrics that would um, talk about um, otherworldness, you know, how can we think about um, blackness and um, some of the social ills uh, in, in society sort of being worked through in a really powerful way in another world, um, but at the same time, uh, centering pleasure too, right? So what sort of pleasure can we get out of these narratives that aren't limited to the present, even though they may be drawing on it, um, but that are also sort of reaching back to the past too. And I also think of writers um, like the late Oct Octavia Butler, right? Um, so um, a very you know brilliant uh, author who brought us so many novels and narratives about um, not just blackness but um, difference more broadly, right? Uh, and so you know for me uh, the power of Octavia Butler's work um, was the way in which she um, engaged with um, science fiction and horror, and as others were saying, she had these futuristic narratives where we could sort of imagine ourselves uh, in, in different ways, but sometimes she would move back and forth between the past and the present and the future as a way to be prescriptive about how we see blackness. So um, you may have characters who are, um, you know, half human um, and, and um, a sort of an otherworldly type of identity as well. And so using that type of narrative to, um, you know, press against seeing uh, ourselves 
in uh, limiting and binary ways, and maybe in some ways sort of um, thinking about the ways in which uh, we might use a sort of otherworldly identity to um, be prescriptive about seeing ourselves outside of these uh, limiting scripts uh, in popular culture and everyday life that are often put upon uh, people of African descent. And you know, so for me, um, we can talk about film too, but um, a lot of what I have been writing on is Afrofuturism in sequential art, right? So, um, and in comics in particular. And so I'm just over the moon that um, Ashley Woods is on the panel because her work has been uh, so fundamental in a sort of contemporary context, um, you know, not just um, with Millennia War, um, but also, you know, we mentioned um, her work on um, Niobe as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, so a really powerful Afrocentric narrative for me uh, is, is Ashley Wood's uh, Millennia War and the way she's able to talk, and I don't want to talk too much about this because I'm sure she's going to talk about her own work. So I'll just say quickly um, that the way she's able to talk about um, conflict and war and uh, identity and how we might achieve social justice and, um, and, and to do so in this sort of world that looks very futuristic. We have characters um, who are, you know, human, elf human of all different types of races and the ones that seem to be marked as people of African descent, um, male and female, they, they look different than a, a lot of characters, uh, black characters that we see. So just a beautiful sort of um, pressing back against um, uh, you know, uh, limiting ways to see blackness or what blackness looks like, um, but also in her narratives too, having these really powerful characters uh, who are not perfect. Uh, you know, they are fallible, um, but some are very intent on uh, ways in which to achieve social justice. Yeah, so maybe we could, Ashley, why don't you go ahead and, and share a little bit about maybe how you bring that aesthetic into your work? You want to talk a little bit about that? Oh, that's a as lot a, to as follow. A, as a, as a <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm going to be honest with you guys. Um, when I first started uh, working as an artist, I, I've only been professional for three years now, but independently, I want to say I've been working, mm, I want to say roughly uh, about 14 years since 2004. So with that being said, I used to approach my work uh, from a very naive perspective, where I would just flesh out a story or a character based on personalities. But then once I entered the real world and I started having experiences and I, and I realized that uh, perception is everything, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of times this is held to a higher uh, state than uh, facts, you know, I mean, especially like in today's climate. So as I, as the years went by and I, and I gained more experience, I realized that what I put out there has, you know, a great impact, you know. So what I'm trying to do as an artist right now is still maintain my personal aesthetic and identity, which is basically just a good story. But at the same time, I don't want to pander, you know. It, it's a fine line, especially being would an artist. I'm sorry, would you say that aesthetic has any, any Afro, Afrocentric elements or are you saying then that that the that the story drives it not the the it has representation necessarily it has afrocentric mm -hmm. elements uh, my personal project uh, niobe yeah. uh, especially my personal project uh, millennial war that one is a bit more diverse it has mm -hmm. no black and everything in there and that one folks focuses more so on um there's some politics in it but it's more so mental states mm -hmm. and, and um, identity but um, in any case, as I was saying, I realized I have a greater responsibility, you know, not just to children mm -hmm. who follow my work and got into art and video games the same way I did as a child, but also um, my peers and even older generations who have something to say, but they're unable to say it because they may affect their job or their livelihoods, right. things like that. How I tackle it is, and I think a lot of artists should do this instead of being vocal with your ideas, just put it into work. Mm. Because mm -hmm. anytime you're vocal, it, psh, 
and just buy over people's heads, you know? <laughs> and I mean, that's, that's, that's everybody, right, you know, whether right. you're an artist or not, wherever your, your walk of life is, because everyone has so much to say and, you know, drowns out, you know, mm -hmm. amongst all the chatter. So I just put it all in the work and yeah. uh, images speak a thousand words. Right. Yeah. Right. And any uh, other comments or thoughts on this question of Afrocentric aesthetics that, that pop up in these Afrofuturistic texts? That, Thanks. Yeah, Jonathan. Yeah, I, I think uh, it's a very interesting question, the relationship between Afrofuturism and Afrocentricity. And I think it's also an important question. Um, I think, you know, John, um, uh, what is John's name? Mm -mm -mm. No, not John Jennings. He's a John Jackson. He's an anthropologist. Yeah, um, yeah. Several mm -hmm. years ago, yeah. wrote a really great article that pushes back against certain articulations of Afrocentricity, and I and I've done the same thing right. elsewhere. And John's uh, argument is is that certain articulations of Afrocentricity lean toward the authentic, and he suggests mm -hmm. that African American studies, my discipline should pursue a more sincere orientation to scholarship and to engagement of, of black life. And I think, you know, in, in, again, in, in certain articulations of Afrocentricity, we lean into the kinds of scripts that Deborah was talking about, where there is one center. And if you are outside of that center, if you are not aligned with that center, somehow you are misaligned and you become inauthentic. And I think that's one of the, the more promising aspects of Afrofuturism is that it doesn't, it, it doesn't deny the possibility of that kind of center, right. but it also expands upon the possibility. So there can't just be one center for all people of African descent. There, you, know, you can draw upon it, but I think one of the promises of Afrofuturism is that it also does this kind of expansive work. And again, returning to the idea of black imagination, you can imagine yourself in the past, in the future, mm -hmm. in a number of different ways without relying upon one sort of symbolic core that makes all of those imaginings legitimate. And so I think there are some important distinctions between, you know, of course, there are many different definitions of Afrofuturism. Mm -hmm. The same is true of Afrocentricity. But I think if you look at certain articulations, that's one of the, the most important um, points of departure between Afrofuturism and Afrocentricity. Yeah, I understand what you mean there. Uh, Leah, uh, Leah. Yeah, um, so thinking about this idea, I was trying to think of examples that, that we could talk about. And of course, as an English professor, I go straight to literature. And, um, and, and one of the first ones I thought of was, uh, was the Binti trilogy by Nnedi Okorafor. Mm -hmm. She does a lot of... Mm -hmm. um, a lot of young adult lit, a lot of uh, just kind of regular literature, and uh, the Binti trilogy is, is um, I would say it's considered more young adult. Right. Um, and it starts with this uh, protagonist who is associated with the Himba tribe, um, but then she goes to university on a different planet. And so there's a way in which there's this kind of African center, if you will, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't take over the entire story, and it doesn't take over her identity in the, in the same way that uh, I think a lot of people would define Afrocentrism. Um, and then um, N.K. Jemisin's Broken Earth Trilogy, which is one of the best things that I've read, period. Um, the, there is kind of people of African descent in there, but the, the cultural identities are more tied to kind of geologic shifts in the earth mm -hmm. and uh, regions as opposed to any specific nation. And so I've been thinking a lot about um, this idea of kind of continent-less African American identity and um, and nationless Black identity in that way because even you know Sun Ra who who's already mentioned who predated the term by a couple of decades um, he wasn't looking to the African continent or to the United States he was looking planetary <laughs> right so so, so um, yeah so I'm not really sure it's just something I've been thinking of I'm not really sure where, where to go with that but there's a way in which this relationship is more is bigger than Afrocentrism. And I think what you all are all sort of reminding me of and, and also reminding me of Deborah's first comment about sort of Alondra Nelson's work in that, that special issue of social text that that's kind of, I mean, I think that 
that that was the the that uh, space of troubling what blackness could and should be, right? Mm -hmm. And that uh, in decades before we might have had notions of blackness that were centered on a kind of authenticity narrative or a kind of uh, traditional narrative of sort of African of the you know a kind of African past that we could all all of us in the diaspora could go back and and go back and get it and and have this sort of true. Um, connection, but I think that what these artists are doing, and even listening to Ashley kind of describe her her process, is that it's so much more complicated than simply saying, "Okay, well, we're going to have this happen on you know in a village, and there's going to be some African print and some traditional foods and some you know these sort of uh, cultural markers that are very uh, sometimes one dimensional, and that the 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 beauty of uh, the, the Afrocentric." Uh, elements of Afrofuturism is that they are really expansive. Sun Ra, I think, is a great dynamic. If you Google him, look him up, you know, he thought, he was like, I'm not even from this earth. I'm from Saturn. And, you know, I, he was a jazz musician, very avant-garde jazz musician, who was also creating art that wouldn't necessarily even be traditionally African in that kind of Afrocentric, traditionalist, authentic narrative. And so, you know, again, from the very start, I think there's this really interesting blend of what we might think of as the signifiers of Africanness uh, that are then remade, reimagined, and repurposed in these really interesting ways, which kind of leads me to the next question, um, which is um, to, to help us think about um, you know, what this particular moment of seeing Black Panther as the kind of contemporary iteration or this sort of mass diasporic uh, touchstone in terms of the, the connection between Afrofuturism and uh, black aesthetics. What, where do you all see this? How do you help us understand what's happening to us today on Black Panther Day? <laughs> How do we, uh, where do we put this? You know, especially for those of us who may not have a deep, uh, background in the comic itself, right? So the, our introduction to this moment is through this Marvel movie. How do we make sense of what's going on? Who, who wants to kind of jump in there? I don't know. Uh, I'll, ahead, I'll jump yeah. in. Yeah, yeah go for it. Uh, being a, a uh, very proud comic book nerd. Yes. And having uh, grown up with T'Challa, personal friend. Um, <laughs> got my hat here. <laughs> He's real, okay. Right, right. Um, so, you know, no spoilers, right? We can't right. offer any spoilers. Please, I, I, I think, no spoilers. You know, the, I, I think the film, having seen it last night, it goes farther than I anticipated that it would go. Yeah. And in pursuing a number of different narratives that are touched upon in the comic book, but not fully developed for any number of reasons. Uh, not the least of which is the fact that for, for its, most of its history, most of the writers uh, of the comic book were white. And I think this moment and the success of the film, the financial success of the film, again returns me to the idea of the legitimacy of, of the black imagination. And, the, and you know, I think there's this, you know, in social media and, and uh, news coverage, there's this idea that this, it, the film represents this moment for black people. It's a moment for all people. It really mm -hmm. is. Um, because, you know, growing up, you know, I say in my film, my documentary, that I felt that I was dreaming someone else's dreams, reading comic books with white superheroes all of the time. And so you learned how to pretend. You learned how to be Thor in Halloween and be miserable, but you had to act like you're, you're, you're Thor. I'm not Thor. Um, flashback, sorry. Um, um, and so for me, it, it this, this idea, again, of the legitimacy of black imagination. So it's not just for black people. I think to the extent that all people can see themselves as powerful, see themselves as heroic in characters like the Black Panther, and being the father of two young daughters, the Dora Milaje, um, I'll just leave it there, um, is, it's, it's a moment for all people. And I think a very important moment for all people. Thank you. Who else? Did so, Deborah? Was that? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'd be happy to chime in. So, yeah. at, you know, at University of Iowa, we're having Black Superhero Week uh, that mostly the students put together, um, but also, um, you know, uh, in, in, you know I, I help them out as well and some other people around campus. And they put this week together um, because they were so excited about the release of the Black Panther and to have an opportunity to, to see themselves 
uh, in the, the comic world to see their likeness and to see representations of black masculinity that um, are not deformed and that are heroic. And, and so part of our week was to show um, Jonathan's documentary on Wednesday, which was um, very powerful um, for the students in um, many ways. And, um, you know, one of the things I really like about um, the documentary, um, White Scripts, Black Supermen, is um, the moments in which they sort of talk about the ways that um, primarily white writers would write black characters and how they like imagined Africa and how they imagined black characters through Africa. And, um, you know, sometimes those representations um, would uh, not seem to really have an engagement with the sort of ethnic cultural specificity of Africa. Uh, and these narratives and print comics were, um, you know, sometimes leaned towards the primitive uh, and oftentimes sort of uh, bordered on like black exploitation. And so I think what's exciting for the Black uh, Panther release is, is we've seen a version of him in the Avengers, which seemed to really press back on how we have seen black masculinity uh, in comics. So it didn't seem like, and it didn't view as sort of more of the same older scripts, right? And um, because we sort of got that slice, I think it, it's made people really excited about um, seeing uh, this character, this African character, this black character uh, on the silver screen, not as part of an ensemble or a sidekick or an afterthought, but at the center of the narrative. And the, you know, the, the, the small moments in which we saw other parts of uh, the Black Panther T'Challa's world, um, as Jonathan was saying, we also saw him in tandem with um, black women uh, who, um, you know, so there's so much to say about the representation of black women in popular culture and in comics as well. Um, but if you just think about the issues of um, colorism in society and uh, the very sort of limiting ways black women are seen, just like black men in terms of uh, sexuality uh, and gender, it was also quite powerful to see him sort of interacting um, with these uh, powerful um, black women who um, weren't looking like the, the type of black womanhood that is often um, sold to us as ideal uh, in popular culture, you know, if, if we're depicted in popular culture at all. So, um, you know, for me, and I think uh, for the students here, especially um, being in, in Iowa, to, to be able to have the Black Panther come out, to be able to go see it and, and look at blackness anew, not in a romantic way, um, but in a way in which um, they, they have not necessarily seen before is uh, very important. I, I, I want to, uh, we, we'll, we'll hear from the other two panelists, but I do want to point out these last two comments really centered on questions of gender, and I do want to make sure we come back, and if, if our next couple panelists want to uh, also talk about that, I think that this is a really great dynamic. I'm glad it's sort of organically emerging in the conversation, but the question really was to try to, to situate this particular moment. What does Black Panther mean uh, right now? So, Leah, Ashley, what? You have comments there? Well, uh, Deborah uh, just mentioned uh, representation. Of course, our, our children need representation. Uh, see, it's good to see yourself on the big screen, especially, um, of course, all, all skin tones within the black community, but especially like darker toned. Um, mm -hmm. The one thing that I really liked uh, about, I seen Black Panther last night, cool movie. Um, I don't want to spoil it. But <laughs> the one thing uh, I really did enjoy about the movie I don't want to say which character it was, but one of the characters touched upon more nuanced um, topics of conversation uh, within the black experience. And it was more so than just uh, slavery. And I don't mean that lightly, not just slavery, right, right, but you get what I mean. You know, we're, we're used to hearing about that all the time. Um, we also, within that point, we also seen the, the connection between, or maybe not the connection, but the gap between um, Africans and African Americans. A lot mm -hmm. of times people just see black and that's it. And, and there's many different experiences under that umbrella of blackness. So we've seen some of that touched upon in uh, Black Panther. I, I want to jump to a different movie. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Get Out, you know, which came out last February. Yeah. The thing I liked about that movie as well, they also touched upon uh, nuanced, you know, conversations. Uh, this time, 
you know, um, the black experience with white people. You know, we got some cool white people out there. You know, we have some some allies, quote unquote. Right. You know, right. <laughs> but then we have some shifty white people. Okay. Like for instance, like it. the one scene when um, what was the main character's name from Get Out? I forget. Anybody know? Just yeah, someone like. If you find it on Wikipedia, oh, you just want to shout it out, just interrupt me. But yeah, the main character from Get Out, uh, the one scene where he goes upstairs and like all the white people stop talking. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if anything that drastic happens in real life. If it does, that's like hella creepy. But <laughs> the, the, the point is, is that um, <laughs> a lot of times um, people who aren't... Chris, yes. thank, you. thank you. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of times people who aren't black, they pay so much attention to us and we're just living, you know, we're just doing the same thing that you're actually doing, you know, but um, like I said before, everything is about perspective. But in any case, I, I don't think those two movies could have been made by any other writer or, or director. You know, both movies were made by a black writer and director, you know, Black Panther, uh, uh, Ryan Coogler, and then Jordan Peele would get out. Um, I don't believe a non-black writer or director can touch upon those those nuanced topics, right. you know. Is Get Out an Afrofuturist text? Yeah, I think so, because okay. it deals with technology. Okay. With the bodies okay. yeah, swapping. Right, yeah. All you know, right. so that can fit, that's, that's what I was thinking. For sure, and yeah. I think also, uh, and Deborah pointed this out earlier, the genre of horror, horror genres also right. fit within the sort of larger umbrella of speculative work that, you know, we might think of. So there's all of this sort of genre movement too that um, maybe texts that we don't that don't you know again are not set in the future per se well, it covers all space but there's some time. there's this yeah there's this element that's there that I think you're really honing in on I'm glad you brought get out um, back to my to my mind yeah Leah what are your thoughts here um, so I can't I, I assume I can't spoil the movies I'm seeing it with two sets of students next week so I'm Trying to you, limit my. Have you my seen it already? <laughs> no. Oh, okay. I, I, figured, I figured two times next week would be enough, but maybe not. I don't know. Maybe I should have just seen it anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, but I'm excited for multiple reasons. I, I'm obviously excited for my African American students, but just um, to have a character who he's already showed up in um, a Captain America movie, and in that movie he was um, he was he's part of the Avengers, but he's nobody's sidekick. So he's, right, okay. he's, he's got his own agenda, he's doing his own thing. Um, and so that's really exciting. And then he's, the, the character T'Challa has a PhD from Oxford in physics. So as an educator, I'm just like, look at this smart guy who's so cool. Um, and then as, as a person of color, um, I, I was just telling my husband this this morning, I still remember as a kid the first time I saw George Takei on TV. Like it was just such a, it was such a monumental moment for me. And um, to have, not only T'Challa there, but to have, have him be as powerful as he is on the backbone of black women. Um, to have the, the Dora Milaje there, to have, um, to have a female as a, a black woman and a scientist. Um, to have all these really smart, intelligent, resourceful um, characters who are, who are techn technologically savvy, who, um, who are, you know, it's, it, it, to me, it's just exciting for, for so many reasons, especially for that gender aspect. I'm, I'm really excited for just all my female students in general to watch this. Can I, can I say something yeah, else ahead. about the gender aspect? So I'm going to get in, I might get in trouble for this. So um, everyone re remember Blade One? Yeah. Right. So Blade One was a very successful film. It was made on a shoestring budget, but it was extremely profitable. And it, it um, created the possibility for, of course, the trilogy, such as it was. Um, the, for me, the Black Panther um, represents a, 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 a important um, uh, distancing from what we see in Blade One. So I've written about this, but there's a sense in Blade, well, it's not a sense, Blade One is very abusive toward all the black women in the film with whom he shares dialogue. So just watch it again. I know we're, we're, there are always blade apologists in the room. <laughs> I was one of them. Um, and but so, you know, reformed. I think no. with, with, within certain communities and with these larger structures, these hierarchies, people within communities 
you know, uh, exert a force downward. And so when I saw Blade One, I was in initially enthralled by the idea of this powerful hero. But I realized very quickly that his powers essentially come at the expense of black women in the film. Watch it again. Um, this is not the case with Black Panther. And so I think we have a, a disruption of the kinds of, again, internal hierarchies that we see in certain communities, in my community. So that T'Challa's power, and this is the case in the comic book as well, especially with re recent iterations of the comic book, T'Challa's power is not derived from others. It doesn't come at the expense of others, in particular black women, which I think is, is, is very important historically, especially as it relates to popular culture and representations of, and performances of black masculinity. So we're seeing perhaps even a, a, a Evolution is always such a, a tough term, but but some some movement, pro, some progressive movement, perhaps in terms of the way we uh, think about gender in these particular genres. The genre, the speculative fiction genres, often are um, coded as masculine genres, right at the very start. And I know for myself, I wasn't a comic book reader as a as a young child, but I was definitely much more into like fantasy novels, and so you know, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and things like that and so for me like as excited as I am about um, Black Panther I'm also excited about A Wrinkle in Time that's coming out a little later this this year yeah. as well so we've got this duality right and hopefully in all of these newer uh, creations we're also just seeing um, th those gender dynamics uh, shift and change right to elevate and hold up people who you know we just didn't really see when we were growing up right um, so I've gotten the uh, alert that we're just about at our uh, 15 minutes left and I did want to have an opportunity for members of the audience to ask their questions of our um, esteemed panel so um, if you have a question that you would like to direct to the panel if you raise your hand I can bring a mic over and you can you can ask it, it Take a second and think for a minute if you'd like to uh, branch out. No? I know it all. I, I'm, I'm a teacher, an experienced teacher. I know it takes about 30 seconds for the question to, to get in, you know, get out your mouth. So we'll, we'll take a second. Over there? Yeah, Chanel. I think you got me. Hello. Hi. Dang. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my question as a as an artist, but also as a um, an engineer and a scholar, this movie is like a holiday. <laughs> it's a really good time. Um, and I think it's interesting that you brought up the idea of pandering to certain type of narratives, but also this idea that there are a lot of uh, issues that are being just completely flipped in terms of how in terms of how we're talking about them. I'm interested if you can talk about. Um, the personality characteristics that we're seeing in these characters, because I did not read the comic book growing up, but when um, Ta-Nehisi Coates did, redid the comic book, I bought all three of those, and I read it, and I, like, my life changed. Um, and what I really appreciated was that the, the characters were a lot more dynamic than I'm used to black people being portrayed. They were able to go through entire, um, almost psychological evolutions in a couple pages. Um, and I think that it speaks volumes to our youth in terms of like what the progress of your art can look like, but also the progress of your purpose in life. Um, so if you could speak a little bit about um, just the, uh, the leadership, the um, emotional maturity, the, the sense of community that the characters in, the, in, the, in both this film, but also that embodies Afrofuturism because it, it takes a certain type of um, orientation towards self an orientation towards the future to really engage in Afrofuturism as an idea. And I think we have a lot of people who are, who are drawn in by the aesthetic but might miss the, the key components of what it means to actually live and be as somebody who believes that their imagination matters, that their conception of, of the future matters. Do you want to take this one? Because I don't know the uh, Yeah. Who uh, wants to jump in there? Go ahead, Jonathan. I, I just really quickly, I think um, Ta-Nehisi Coates and Roxanne Gay's work in, yes. in just in general in Wakanda is, extremely important and for me uh, returning to this idea of, of disrupting you know these gender representations sex role uh, heteropatriarchy heteronormativity so you know the black panther and one of the cr critiques of the comic book character is that he's the 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 head the spiritual head political head etc of this important nation 
but he spends most of his time in the United States mucking around with the Avengers. So the question that ta Coates and Roxanne Gay pose is, well, what happens to Wakanda? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who's taking care of Wakanda? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, this is Dora, the Dora Milaje. Right. These strong women who are aligned with Wakanda, not with T'Challa. You know, they're aligned with T'Challa to the extent that he serves Wakanda. And, you know, so this is not in the film, it's in the comic book, and it was okay, we can do spoiler alerts to the comic book, but there, there's, a, there's a lesbian relationship among the Dora Milaje, which speaks to the centrality of their experience, their selfhood. You never see that in comic books, and you n absolutely never see that as it relates to black women in comic books. And so there's, there's an attention to, um, and a lot of people have cr uh, criticized Coates and Gates, it's too slow, so on and so forth, superheroes. I want to know about Wakanda, you know what I mean? And so there's this, this, this intentionality around centering these women, centering the politics of Wakanda that I, that I encourage everyone to read. And I'm just, I, I, I love the series right now. I love it right now. Excellent. Deborah, I, I want to miss you back here. Any, any thoughts to the, the, the last couple questions or conversations on the table? Yeah, sure, and I, I, I hope this is related and doesn't take us too far off. So you know, we were talking about um, Afrocentric narratives and the difference between um, African characters, um, Black American characters, and um, I was just sort of interested in, in talking about, you know, whether we're talking about ta Coates' Coates's Black Panther or, or, or Hedlund or even reaching back. Is the Black Panther really an African character, or is he an African American character or an American character because these are Americans that are drawing upon their imagination of what they think Africa is through this character? And so I've just, you know, sort of been um, like, like wondering about that. And um, is it, um, you know, how would the Black Panther look if it was, you know, I don't want to be essentialist to say that if it was, you know, written by someone who is African, that it would do some type of um, different or more transformative work. Um, but I, I, I do think it's important to sort of, you know, maybe think about, and I don't know if anyone has um, ideas about this as well, um, that the Black Panther is, is still uh, Africanist through the American imagination. Right? Um, and maybe this is what um, Ashley was getting at earlier um, as well, and sort of thinking about the differences between Black American, African American, and African uh, characters or, or identities and how they get muddled and um, how they can be sort of um, thought through in connection, but maybe um, um, disarticulated too. This, you know, this question of authorship is huge. I mean, I think this is why we are, you know, celebrating these moments where we are having black creatives at the table, uh, you know, in these leadership positions, making film, making uh, all this content. But yeah, how do, you know, how do we keep that conversation going? I mean, I, I don't know if uh, Leah, Ashley, any thoughts on that? Well, I, perspective. I think part of that is just um, the change in times. Like we have social media, everybody is able to get their their um, sentiments, you know, out there like instantaneously. So, you know, I grew up in the 90s. I was a 90s child. Um, my youth versus the youth of today, the millennials, um, the millennials are like way more outspoken, you know, and they're absolutely not having any of the, you know, the politics, you know, certain types of politics. And like I said, they're fighting back more and that translates um, in the media that we take in now, you know, our comics, our games, the stories that we see nowadays. And um, I don't see it going backwards. If anything, it's gonna become more reflective of possibly our true history if we ever discover the, the, full, the full true history of, you know, black culture and, you know, um, systematic oppression. You know, people argue, you know, how uh, oppressed are we systematically, you know, um, me personally, I feel like there's no other experience that can compare to the black experience, um, not even the gay uh, agenda. I, I was not agenda, but the, the whole the gay experience that can't really uh, translate or compare either. So 
And there's a black gay experience, right? So right. we also want to make sure that we have that complexity open as well, right? Yeah. Right, right. The world is like way more, you know, bigger. But in any case, um, our media is, is only going to, our stories are only going to get more outspoken and, and true to how people think and feel of that uh, culture. So and let me follow up really quickly, though. I wonder whether you believe, so kind of back to Deborah's point, like, you know, you as, an, as a creative making the kind of content, writing Niobe, for example, um, do you feel that there is something uh, intrinsic to you as a black woman being able to tell the story in a particular way that perhaps another kind of writer cannot approach because of not having that lived experience? Because I feel like that's kind of the, the root of maybe the, the debate or the question. I, yeah. I can relate to that yeah. question more so from like uh, artistic um, um, perspective because Amandala and uh, mm -hmm. Stranger Comics, they wrote Niobe together. Mm -hmm. And so by the, by the time I was brought onto the project, the story was already uh, fleshed out and all of that. So how I will approach that personally, um, I, I, I just feel like just drawing of a, a female black character and she's so nuanced and she has she's fleshed out she has thoughts and feelings and and she actually has character development you know she doesn't like feed into any you know tropes or like angry black woman mm -hmm. or strong mm -hmm. black woman mm -hmm. you know whatever um you know that's important uh representation is important i i feel like just me being who i am and what i am in the past i didn't realize how important it was. As I said, I was you know, naive starting out 14, 15 years ago. I just looked at everything um, plainly, like I'm an artist, this is the art, good story. But now I understand like, you know, just me being who I am and doing what I do, that, that plays an important role. That's you know, impactful to younger generations. Um, I didn't come from an easy background. Um, so hopefully uh, people who also don't come from an easy background can see that you can you know, get it done. Um, I haven't put my story out there. I probably won't because it's too personal, you know, but just know, you know, I, I've seen and experienced some things. But in any case, uh, you know, so me being a black female, Amanda being a black female, and then Niobe being a, a black female um, a character, it, like the book actually made history being like the first um, uh, comic book, you know, written, created, and uh, drawn by all, you know, and featuring, you know, just all black female cast, you know, so, um, yeah. Making history out here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, we have another question, and this will probably have to be our last. Uh, yes, you have to speak into the mic and stand up, Leonard. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming. I really appreciate your, 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 your coming. Uh, to the BCC. A uh, quick, quick, uh, my, my, I would argue that it's definitely an African film. Um, I don't want to spoil the film for you, but you know, there's, there's, you know, there's in the Benedict, the Shona, the Zulu, there, the we may have missed the importance of the, 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 the Nigerian girls being liberated at the early part of the mm -hmm. film, the stolen girls. Um, those are all African. The language is African, um, and so a lot would be might be missed by African Americans precisely because it's African um, in those ways. The Indibeli, the Shona, the Zulu, they're all represented there. Um, and then, you know, it happens in Nigeria. I mean, this is fascinating. Um, but my question is, for, for my students, be sure you sign before you leave. <laughs> uh, um, what do you think is the most important feature of the film that's universally valuable? I mean, Sun Ra, Parliament Funkadelics, um, um, you know, that adulthood rights series, you know, they, they break the mold. You know, I mean, Octavia Butler's, Leon Carly, they, they have, they, they are shape shifters. You know, they're black, among other things, but they, they're also all veg veg vegetarians. There's no Christian motif, mm -hmm. right? Um, the same with Sun Ra, you know, and the same with the Parliament Funkadelics. What do you think are the most important features of this film that's universally applicable? Um, mm. Thanks. That's universally African. Is that applicable? Applicable. Right. That okay. sort of transcends, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I don't know if this takes us afar, so um, but maybe a way to sort of connect up where we are here with where we started the difference between Afrocentric and Afrofuturism. And so I haven't seen the Black Panther yet. 
but what I'm hearing from people and, and having, you know, read the comic books and the graphic novel, um, at least by some sort of the later iterations, that is that there's some aspect of intersectionality. Uh, and, um, you know, so uh, Afrocentrism has been critiqued sometimes for being a masculinist narrative, for, for romanticizing Africa, um, for being um, more mythic uh, and um, not seeing sort of other identities, um, other types of black identities uh, in the mix. And it, it, it's sounding to me like the Black Panther is very intersectional, right? Um, so it's thinking through gender, class, uh, nation, um, sexuality, ethnicity, you know, all these identities in relationship to each other and troubling it um, and not having um, an Africa that is um, deformed, um, but that's really nuanced. And so I guess the connection for me, like the applicability is um, to be able to talk about and imagine and connect to an African past that's neither um, romanticized or that's neither um, monolithic, um, but sees uh, race, ethnicity, nation as a kind of um, generative source of identity. Um, and, you know, thinking about people of African descent, as some others have said, um, as, as sort of, you know, thinking people who have uh, something to offer the world in terms of of leadership in terms of culture uh, and in terms of a lot of ways in which, uh, at least in everyday life, uh, oftentimes we're not necessarily thought of in that way as someone who can be a leader, um, as someone who has a legible cultural identity outside of a kind of black popular culture or just popular culture um, imaginary. Okay. I did think we had one more hand up is that true okay great and I want to add I'm thinking to Leonard's question as well I, I think that one of the key points this is we have to have more than this movie right so these themes and these uh, these articulations I think that you're talking about I haven't seen the film yet but the way that we're going to even make these legible to people is to have to build on that that uh, uh, that kind of legibility, right, in culture, right? We have, you know, I grew up in the in the Star Wars era, right? We live in a moment where any little child knows the mythology of Star Wars, knows it better than Greek mythology, right? And so in some ways, I think there's a way in which this can't be a one-off. You know, if we want some of this knowledge to be transmitted through th this particular cultural form, it's gotta be something that we sustain. We'll have our last question here. Thank you, and I, actually it's along those same lines. Um, so Hollywood and films in general can promote certain stereotypes, but they can also challenge norms. Um, so I'm thinking of, you know, the movie, uh, uh, a Hollywood movie uh, uh, featuring a black president and the impact that resulted from that, right? Um, what changes or what impacts do you think Black Panther will have on society, can have on society, aside from the educational piece, right? Mm -hmm. what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Leah, you wanna? Yeah, um, so kind of combining that question with, with Leonard's question, I think that one of the more interesting nuanced things that, um, that I've heard in the discussion of the creation of the movie is, is the collaborative nature of it. And so I think that one of the more exciting and nuanced aspects of Afrofuturism is this idea of, of communal voices and community voices. Um, even I was just listening to this interview with the, uh, the fashion designer for the movie and how she um, took uh, influences from Ghana and then also influences from the United States and just kind of uh, created this sort of pastiche that has become the aesthetic of the movie and is, distinctly African, but also not. Um, and so I think that that sort of speaks to this idea of there being kind of a community voice that creates something new and interesting and, um, and definitely more nuanced. I feel like, um, well, we, we touched upon gender roles within the movie, you know, T'Challa and his relationship with the female uh, army mm -hmm. that watches over Wakanda. But also, you know, you mentioned his um, costume designer, uh, Ryan Coogler worked with a, a female um, team, you know, and I think that's pretty much, that's pretty important because one of the, how do I say this? 
what I see a lot floating around is, is this whole black men against black women uh, mm -hmm. thing going on. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that, that is pushed, you know, that, that agenda is pushed depending on who you're talking to. And that's not really the case at all. Um, and if it is the case, that happens on a very small scale, just like most negative uh, things that you see in the media. You know, the world isn't really going crazy. You know, it's just who can speak the loudest. You know, most people aren't bigoted. You know, most people aren't, um, you know, you get it. So with that being said, I think that's really cool that it's, it's being put out there that Ryan is working with, you know, a female team um, and they're getting it done the same way, just as good as any other team. Um, yeah, yeah. I had another point, but I'm going to leave it there okay. so I could like end it smooth. You <laughs> know, <laughs> hey, and 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 uh, we could keep talking, y'all. I, I unfortunately have come to the end of our time today. Can we please thank our panelists for their insights, their thank their you. research, their scholarship? Thank you all. Thank yourselves for taking the time to come out here and be with us to to celebrate Black Panther Day. Uh, I'm going to see it this evening. I'm really excited excited um, and I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Um, I don't know if the panelists are available for small chatting afterward, but um, thank you again for your time and I'll see you around. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks thank everyone. you, Deborah. Thank you.